Hi there, it's Cheryl Lee from Anatomy for the People. In this video, I'm going to be talking about anatomical position, directional terms, and some anatomical prefixes that you will come across as you are learning anatomy and physiology. So let's start with the anatomical position. The anatomical position is a reference position for anatomical location terms. So everything is gonna be based off this standard agreed upon position. And now I'm gonna demonstrate this anatomical position on this model here. So the anatomical position is with an individual standing upright, face forward, and your upper limbs by your side. Your palms are facing forward. The thighs and the legs run straight down with the feet facing forward and are a shoulder width apart. An interesting fact about the anatomical position in males is that the penis is erect. So that's a fun little fact for you. So using the standard anatomical position, we're going to be referring to all body parts and, and locations in reference to this position. For example, the head is above the shoulders, the shoulders are above the pelvis, the pelvis is above the knees, we could say that the feet are below the knees. So even when your body position changes, we are still going to refer to the location of things on your body in reference to the anatomical position. So even if you are lying down, so back towards the ground and chest facing up, this position is actually called the supine position, so lying on your back. So even when we're in this position, we would still say that the head is above the chest and so forth. And then another common position is face down. So face down towards the floor and back towards the sky. So this position is called the prone position and we would still refer to our anatomical locations in reference to the anatomical position. So the pelvis is still above the feet and so forth. Okay, so now that we know the correct anatomical position, let's go over some directional terms. So when we use directional terms in anatomy, it's about describing the location of organs, injuries, uh, landmarks, and things like that. Directional terms generally come in pairs like top and bottom, front and back, but the terminology is a little bit different to that. So let's start with superior and inferior. So superior means towards the head. And the opposite of superior would be inferior, so things that are going towards the feet. So some examples of superior and inferior, we could say that the head is superior to the pelvis. And then we could flip that around and say that the pelvis is inferior to the head. There are lots of examples that we could do. I'll just give you one more. We could say that the feet are inferior to the knees uh, and the knees are superior to the feet. So superior towards the head, inferior towards the feet. So you always have to look at the two things that you are comparing and seeing which one is closer to the top and which one is closer to the bottom. And that's how you can determine if it is superior or inferior to the structure that you're talking about. Okay, so another term that we use very commonly in anatomical uh, descriptions or in names of things uh, would be medial and lateral. So I'm just going to draw a line down the middle and this is going to be the midline. Okay, so things that are closer to the midline would be termed medial and things further away would be termed lateral. So things closer, medial and further away, lateral. So a good example of medial and lateral would be that the nose is medial to the ears. And then you could say that the ears are lateral to the nose. Again, lots of examples that you could do there, but generally the things that are closer to the midline would be termed medial and things further away from the, the midline would be termed lateral. So you can see that I've drawn a side view of an individual. This is because I need to do this to demonstrate anterior and posterior, so essentially front and back. So things that are more towards the front side of the body would be termed anterior, and things closer to the back side of the body would be posterior. So some examples of anterior and posterior is that the nose is anterior to the back of the head. 
and then the back of the head is posterior to the nose. And again, the umbilicus, so your belly button, is anterior to your spine, and then your spine is posterior to your umbilicus. Other terms for anterior and posterior are actually ventral and dorsal. So these can be used interchangeably and you will come across them in your anatomy textbooks. So another term that we use in anatomy is proximal and distal. So proximal and distal is about something being further away and something being closer. So things that are further away from its origin point, so we'll say the upper limb, would be distal. And things that are closer would be proximal. So an example of proximal and distal is that you could say that the hand is distal to the elbow. And then if you flip it around, the elbow is proximal to the hand. You can do this down in the lower limb. The foot is distal to the pelvis and the pelvis is proximal to the foot. And I just want to add in here that there are other terms for superior and inferior, and that would be cranial and caudal. And cranial means head and caudal actually means tail, so towards the head or towards the tail. And finally, our last directional terms will be superficial and deep. And to demonstrate that, I'm going to do a cross section through the thigh. So if we did a cross section like this and had a look in here. So this circle would be the skin. On the inside, we've got the bone, which is the femur. And then we've got a layer of muscle. Layers, lots of layers of muscles. So the two terms would be superficial and deep. Superficial would be things that are closer to the outside of the body and deep would be things deeper inside the body. So an example of that would be the skin is superficial to the muscle and it's also superficial to the bone. The muscle is superficial to the bone as well because that's closer to the outside than the bone. And then if we use deep, the bone is deep to the muscle and also deep to the skin. And if you look at the muscle, the muscle is deep to the skin. So you can see that there's lots of different combinations we can do here and there's lots and lots of examples throughout the body. So now I'm gonna move on to some common anatomical prefixes that you will come across throughout your journey in learning anatomy and physiology. Okay, so the purpose of these anatomical prefixes is to help describe the structure. So is this structure below something or is it above something? Is it around an organ? Is it inside the organ? So once you understand these commonly used prefixes, learning anatomy and the names of structures will become much easier as you start to understand the language that is used really commonly in this science. So I'm going to give you an example of how the name of a structure tells us a lot about where it is and what it is. So let's do subscapularis muscle. So the prefix that's been used here is sub and Sub is common in our everyday language and it means below. So scapularis is our root word and scapularis is related to the scapula. So that funny shaped bone that is on your back, you may know it as your shoulder blade. So this is telling us that we have a muscle underneath the scapula. And as you move through anatomy and physiology, you will learn lots of root words, which actually makes the naming of things make complete sense. There are, however, some structures in the body that will not follow this rule of prefix and root word together. And this is because there are some structures in the body that are still named after the people that discovered them. And there's also things that are named after what the structure looks like. Is it circular? Is it bulbous? Is it plate-like? Okay, so let's have a look at some of these anatomical prefixes. So trust me, if you understand the meaning of these prefixes, it's going to make your learning journey of anatomy and physiology so much easier. So I'm going to draw a circle. And so with reference to this circle, I'm going to be talking about these prefixes and how they relate to certain structures. So let's start with something that might be above something else. So the prefix for above is supra. So an example of supra could be suprarenal gland. So this is telling us we have a gland above the kidney. So suprarenal gland. So the opposite of supra is infra. 
and this refers to something that is below something else. So an example of infra is a nerve that pops out underneath the eye socket. And so that is called the infraorbital nerve. So we have a nerve underneath the orbit. So you can see how these prefixes are describing the location of certain structures. So another thing that means above would be super. So if any term has soup in it as the prefix, you can generally assume it's something that is above a structure or above something else. Another thing that can mean uh, above, but also has a double meaning is epi. Epi also means above, but it can also mean surrounding or even upon or on. So an example of epi could be epidermis. So we know dermal is associated with skin. So epidermis is actually that outermost layer. So the, the one that's um, above on top. Another example of how it means more like surrounding would be epicardium. And epicardium is actually the outermost layer of the heart. So epi, surrounding, cardium, heart. So for epi, on this diagram here, I'm going to do a little line around here so you remember that epi also means surrounding and upon or on. So another prefix that means below is sub. And I used that in my example before of subscapularis muscle. Okay, so let's have a look at prefixes that mean inside, outside. So inside is endo and also intra. And the opposites of that, so they have their pairs, will be exo and extra. And this means outside. So some examples of endo would be endometrium. So that is the inner lining of the uterus, endometrium. So metrium is the root word that is associated with uterine structures. Also endocardium, the innermost layer of the heart wall. Intra, so an example of intra could be intrapulmonary pressure, so pressure that exists within the lungs. And some examples of exo, so exo is not used too much for naming anatomical structures, but more physiological processes, so like exocytosis, so when, when things are being pushed out of cells. So an example of extra would be describing structures that are surrounding the lung, so extra plural structures, for example, ribs and the associated muscles. So these are the basic ones that you have for your inside uh, versus outside. Okay, so some other terms that we have are inter, and inter means between. So say if there's another structure here, I don't know what that is. It's a structure, a schematic structure, just go with it. Uh, so inter means between. So an example of inter could be interstitial fluid, so fluid between the cells. So be careful not to mix up inter with intra. So inter is between, intra is inside. Okay, and lastly, we have para. So para means alongside. So it could be this wobbly structure here. So it's alongside. Para also generally means surrounding as well. Um, so you can see how some of these terms overlap. But generally, if you understand these prefixes, you should, you should be pretty set with uh, looking at the names of structures and, and processes. So para, an example would be uh, paravertebral muscles. So that would be muscles that are alongside the vertebral column or your spinal column. Another example could be parathyroid glands. So these are small glands that are located on the lateral aspect of the thyroid gland on the back. So they are alongside the thyroid gland. Okay, so that's anatomical position, directional terms, and an introduction to anatomical prefixes. So this is really essential information when you're starting on your journey with anatomy and physiology. 
So being able to break down the names of certain structures can tell you a lot about it. So it can tell you a lot of information. It can tell you about where it is, what it is, sometimes what it does. So I hope that you've learned something today. Thanks for joining me. See you next time. Bye.